good morning and uh, welcome to the 29th meeting of the committee in 2015. Uh, everyone is present is asked to switch off mobile phones and other electronic equipment as they affect the broadcasting system. Some committee members may consult tablets during the meeting. This is because we provide papers in a digital format. Uh, we have received uh, apologies today from Cara Hilton. Um, our first item of business this morning is to take evidence on the Burial and Cremation Scotland Bill as part one of our stage one consideration. Uh, can I welcome Andrew Brown, representing the National Association of Funeral Directors, Tim Morris, representing the Institute of Cemetery and Cremation Management, Rick Powell, representing the Federation of Burial and Cremation Authorities, and Robert Swanson, the Inspector of Crematoria Scotland. Uh, can I ask the witnesses, do any of you want to make an opening statement? Uh, Mr Brown, then, please. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm Andrew Brown. I'm the North Sector Operations Manager for Co-op Funeral Care. I have responsibility for 124 funeral homes across Scotland and 20 in Northern Ireland. I'm here today representing the National Association of Funeral Directors, of which the Co-op is the largest member in Scotland. NAFD have 85 members in Scotland operating 369 funeral homes. Across the UK, over 80% of all funerals are conducted by our members. The Association ensures that its members set the highest standard of customer care in the industry through a robust code of practice, code of professional standards and an independent arbitration scheme. The NAFD welcomes the Burial and Cremation Scotland Bill as it seeks to update and rationalise some outdated legislation. In responding to the questions raised by the committee, the NAFD have taken what we believe to be the best interests of bereaved families uh, we serve into consideration, along with the implications uh, on our members' businesses. The questions around reuse of layers and headstones and the proximity of housing and highways to crematoria do not directly affect funeral directors in the same way as burial and cremation authorities, but these proposals could impact on the clients that we serve. The biggest um, impact on our members and our primary concern about which the committee seeks feedback is around the inspection and licensing of funeral directors. If statutory regulation is to be introduced, the NAFD stands ready to advise and assist. However, we would urge the uh, government to fully utilise the association's existing and well-established codes and standards rather than seeking to define and introduce a new separate set of codes and standards that would run in parallel to our own. One of our concerns is around potential cost implications for the funeral businesses, which could in turn lead to increases in funeral costs, exacerbating issues of funeral poverty, eh, which the Scottish Government is already exploring. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to give a... Mr Powell. Good morning. Um, I'd like to thank you for inviting the Federation of Burial and Cremation Authorities to provide oral evidence uh, to the committee in respect to the proposed Burial and Cremation Scotland Bill. Uh, the FPCA represents the owners and operators of cemeteries and crematoria across the whole of the UK and currently represents 26 of the 28 operational crematoria in Scotland and a further crematorium that's currently under development. Uh, the FPCA executive and technical committees have discussed the bill at length and in addition a special meeting of representatives of the FPCA's Scottish subcommittee was convened on the 16th of November to facilitate detailed discussions prior to the views being submitted. The FBCA agrees that the existing legislation relating to burial and cremation should be repealed and replaced by a new legislative framework, and this should apply to all cemeteries and crematoria in Scotland. The call for written evidence asks for particular consideration to be given to a series of points, and as you'll no doubt have had the opportunity to read through our submission, I'll not go through it again at this point. However, I must emphasise how uncomfortable our organisation is uh, around the potential removal of the 200-yard minimum distance requirement that currently exists when crematoria are built in the vicinity of, pri of private dwellings. I must stress that the FPCA disagrees most strongly with this particular proposal. In addition, the FPCA strongly recommends the retention of the current provisions that exist to ensure there's a minimum distance requirement the location of new crematoria also in relation to highways. <clears throat> the FPCA firmly believes that the positioning of crematoria 
is of vital importance in order that the bereaved families are not subject to the day-to-day -day activities that take place in residential areas and their gardens. When attending a funeral service or visiting the crematorium, the bereaved are entitled to expect to be able to spend time in peaceful and meaningful contemplation. The routine of daily living, included, including parties in the gardens, barbecues and accompanying music, do not in any way fit with the tranquil setting that we've come to expect in this type of location. There are numerous examples where planning authorities have allowed private housing and highway developments to take place in very close proximity to crematoria facilities. This has detracted from the natural beauty of many of these locations and had a negative impact upon the ambience of the setting for these important facilities. Rather than removing the 200-yard and 50-yard rules, the FPCA would much rather see action taken by legislators to protect these vital locations and prevent subsequent developments literally up to the curtilage of the crematoria grounds, therefore protecting the setting for the bereaved families that we try to serve. In conclusion, on behalf of the Federation members, I'd like to thank you again for the opportunity to give evidence to the committee this morning. Thank you. Mr. Morris or Mr. Swanson, Mr. Morris, please. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for inviting the Institute to uh, attend today. Uh, the Institute represents burial and cremation authorities throughout the UK and provides education and training opportunities to those persons working within those services. The Institute welcomes the actions of the Scottish Government in modernising burial and cremation and associated legislation and its attempts to reduce the burden of funeral poverty. The Institute would wish to positively assist the Scottish Government in achieving its objectives. Thank you. Mr Swanson, do you have anything to add? Uh, yes, good morning and thanks uh, for the invite as well. Uh, my appointment as HM Inspector of Crematoria for Scotland came about as a direct result following on from the Lord Bonamy report, as you'll be aware. Uh, I took up that post in March of this year. Since that time, I've been around all 28 crematoria in Scotland. Uh, it's an opportunity for the management and the staff there to demonstrate to me all their working practices. Uh, I've done that, and I'm currently now going round them again, uh, doing more formal inspections. Uh, my appointment, uh, there was provision within the existing legislation for that. However, there was no detail at all about what the role would entail, and there was no powers associated and attached to it. Uh, the job description in which we gave was therefore decided on in advance uh, of my appointment, and it was basically to ensure that the relevant uh, legislation and best practice uh, was uh, being put in place around all 28 crematoria, ensuring the documents and records and that were in accordance with statutory provisions, being a member of National Committee and some other committees, uh, and also to deal with any complaints which were coming in from either from the members of the public or professional bodies. Uh, and again, in the short space of time that I've been in post, uh, I have dealt with a few of those as well. So that's a brief resume on it. It's a practical side that I can speak to here and my own uh, experience and knowledge of what I have witnessed and gone round all 28. Thank you. Um, can I start by asking uh, why you think that there's a need for the bill um, and what are the issues that are currently faced uh, by the industry that needs to be addressed? Mr Brown, please. I think, I think the need for the bill is, is generally due to the outdated nature of the existing legislation that's in place. Um, the, the, there's also a need uh, for, for many of the things, which I'm not sure if this committee are, are um, interested in, but around the recommendations from Lord Bonamy's report. Um, so um, the NEFD would definitely support many of the, uh, the changes that are being made. Uh, in the bill as a result of that. You'll be aware that um, the Health and Sport Committee are looking at many of the aspects of that part of the bill. Yeah. Um, Mr Morris. Yes, I, I'd agree that the, the legislation does need modernising um, in, in order to actually set the rights and responsibilities, the rights of the bereaved and the responsibilities of burial and cremation authorities for delivering modern services. Okay, Mr Powell, please. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd, I'd agree with, with both Andrew and Tim. Uh, 
The legislation is, is very outdated, unfortunately, these days. The cremation regulations go back to 1935, although there have been one or two uh, amendments since then. And the burial regulations obviously go back much, much further than that. It, uh, it really is important to, to ensure that the, the legislation that we're working to is very much current and, and I think recognises the issues that face the industry at the moment. And some of those may be around reuse of grave layers or, or um, obviously bringing the, the, the control and, and regulation of crematoria into the, into, into the current century. Thank you. Mr Swanson, please. Uh, like others, I would say the legislation itself is very much outdated, needs to be brought up to date. Uh, also, I think the opportunity was there now in light of the findings uh, uh, of the, the Lord Bonamy and the Dame Eilish inquiry before that, that had to be taken cognizance of and which, in fact, would not have been brought to the fore had it not been for those investigations. Uh, there has also been some comments made to me regarding the non-regulation of uh, certain aspects of the funeral industry, which is felt uh, needs to be addressed as well. Um, you've all suggested that uh, it's required because the current legislation is outdated. Um, can I ask you what, to what extent you think the current bill is future-proofed? Mr Swanson. From my perspective, it is a new role and it is an opportunity there, uh, and if supported by legislation uh, for the role in which I and perhaps any other inspectors would take on, there is a void at the moment uh, where we have the Institute and we have the Federation here, but actually we don't have anybody here who's physically going around each of them to look at the, the, de de the, the detail uh, what is happening in more close detail. The opportunity for the expansion of the inspectors in each of the respective areas would provide that. Uh, I myself have been welcomed by the crematoria around Scotland. Uh, it's not that we're seen as being a, a kind of big brother coming in to see what is happening. Uh, they welcome the opportunity and I get favourable feedback from them. And likewise, it's my understanding that there is a support for a similar role in the respective areas concerning burial and for the, uh, the funeral directors. Mr Powell. I'd, I'd agree with, uh, with, with Bert. Um, obviously, the other issue that, or other issues that the, that the bill covers are, as I mentioned just now, the reuse of layers, bearing in mind the shortage of burial land uh, that, that may be facing uh, burial authorities. I think the bill also uh, future proofs the, the potential alternatives to cremation in the future, whether that may be something along the lines of promotion or resumation. Uh, the, the, the bill is written in such a way uh, that there's a, there's a possibility to actually bring those into, into legislation as and when necessary. Mr Morris. The, uh, the, the new legislation will give the opportunity to make regulation beneath it, which would ensure uh, operation and, and management of cemeteries and crematoria is standardised uh, uh, across all authorities. The introduction of the, the bringing back into reuse um, old abandoned lairs will help in some way in reducing <coughs> funeral poverty as it will alleviate the need for building new cemeteries, uh, the, the, the capital cost of that and the additional maintenance costs which in, in effect will uh, reduce the pressure to increase fees and it should be remembered that most burial services are subsidised at the present time. Um, regulation of the, of the whole of the industry, again, will, will bring a standard and, and provide reassurance to bereaved people. Thank you, Mr Brown, please. I don't think I have anything to add um, over and above what's already been said, thanks. Fine, thank you. Uh, John Wilson, please. Thank you, Kevier. Good morning. Mr Swanson, uh, earlier response you said there should be more regulation. Do you think this bill actually takes forward the level of regulation that you see being required, as the convener mentioned earlier, to try and future-proof the situation? Because the last time it, any major amendments to the legislation was in 1935. Do we have something that's coming forward in this bill 
that will be future-proofed and will actually encapsulate everything that we would want to encapsulate that would take us into the future. Uh, yes, I certainly uh, I do believe that to be the case. I mean, there's been a lot has gone on in the past few months uh, as regards codes of practice, etc. And all of that is actually giving the crematoria at the moment uh, the opportunity to put these matters in place. And can I say they all do, they all wholeheartedly do, but where anything is guidelines or if it's uh, offered to somebody, they have an option to comply with it or not. And I think that's probably the difference here I've seen is that as I go around uh, and I look at the various practices that's been put in place, and, and that ranges from just the, you know, the, the, the identity card system, the cremation card system, the ashes, all the rest of it, they should not differ all that greatly and every single one of the crematoria, a coffin arrives at one end and there's ashes at the other. It's that bit in between. And there is a variance. There's a variance across it. And when I speak to some of them about their working practice, they say, we've, this is the way we've done it. We've done it for 20 odd years. There's never been an issue. Why should we change to somebody else? I think they are very receptive to it, but the point I make is that there is a difference, a strong difference between guidelines and legislation, and if you don't have the teeth to back it up and say you will do it, and if you don't do it, there is potentially a penalty. I don't think, in all honesty, it's not my experience that that would ever be the, needed to be the case. Any other member, any comments on that? Anyone else wish to come in on that point? It's just that if, if that's the case, then the problem or part of the problem may have been that we have legislation and this legislation that's going through at the present moment may end up in guidance being issued to operators. I, Mr Swanson, you've indicated that you'd rather see things in legislation rather than in guidance to try and get that conformity and the no, throughout Scotland in relation to what you and your role would like to see happening uh, in crematoria and cemeteries throughout Scotland. So do you think that everything that is currently in the bill satisfies your issue about guidance rather, legislation rather than guidance being issued? Mr Swanson. I mean, I would say certainly in an ideal world, there should be no need uh, for legislation. Everybody should be complying and doing things, but we all know that not to be the case. It's the same in the, in the outside world here, uh, in my previous occupations in the police service. I mean, you, you have, people shouldn't hit each other, but we have a, a criminal charge. We have legislation which prohibits and forbids them from doing that. And more importantly, we have a penalty for that. So in an ideal world, we shouldn't need it, but if there is guidance which has been prepared and produced and disseminated as a result of it being a legislative requirement, I think that has to be a better option. Okay. Mr. Morris. Mr. Morris, then, please. I'd agree that the guidance does provide some reassurance on future proofing. It's much easier to review some guidance should there be any change in circumstances or wants and needs of bereaved people where a change is warranted. Anyone else? Mr Powell. All, all I'd say really is in relation to Mr Swanson's comments that I think what he may have seen is sort of adjustments of, of, of protocols, if you like, which are probably in reaction to, to events. Um, the, the important thing, obviously, is, as, as Mr Swanson has said, is that a, a body arrives at, at the crematorium and ashes are created at, at the other end of the process. That all of the, the, the issues in between, such as identification, proper uh, handling of the body, the following of the code of cremation practice, are, are addressed by each of the crematoria. But the, the recording of, of, say, the details on a, on a card that follows those remains through may be slightly different from one crematorium to another. And that may be a reaction to, to perhaps the problem that they've had in the past. So there may not be identical practices at each crematorium, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the practices are, are, are faulty. Okay, John. Mr Morris, in relation to the comments made by Mr Powell, 
what advice does your you know, the institute give to your members in relation to some of the issues that have arisen and some of the issues that we may face in the future? Uh, because clearly, as the institute, you have some role in training and advising your members in good practice. Uh, so, uh, is there any lessons that the institute has learned from the process? Well, really, I, I, I sort of agree with uh, with uh, Rick. Um, the, the standard processes in between the arrival of the coffin and and the uh, the, the giving over of, of the ashes are basically standard throughout all UK crematoria. There are just slightly different uh, administrative, um, just administrative differences, which, um, again, so, some are adapted in light of any, any problems that have been identified. But the standard processes are pretty much the same. Go for that question. Thank you. And in terms of, you've talked about um, the coffin coming in. You've talked about the ashes at the end and the differences in between, but I want to, to concentrate on the end process, if you like. We have had a submission um, which should s suggests that the um, current container that is used in the UK is uh, almost standard at 3.2 litres to contain ashes. Um, it's been suggested that that isn't large enough um, to deal with a larger person or um, maybe a person who has been cremated in a, an eco-coffin. Um, and they believe that the container should be increased up to five litres, as found in most of Europe and America. Um, do you have a view on that, Mr Swanson, first of all, please? Uh, the only experience I have in any comments regarding that is I have... A been told uh, that there have been a very few occasions when in fact the ashes have exceeded the, the, the quantity that can be held in the current one. In cases of that, they've put them into a second urn. So the person has two urns two instead urns. of this one. Yes, that's what I've been told. I haven't witnessed it firsthand. So, uh, I don't, to me, there would be very few occasions when this would appear to be the case. I accept that, yes, they're all commenting that there is more outsized coffins coming in, and it's my understanding it's not the actual body that's producing any of the extra. It's perhaps the, uh, the vessel in which the, the, the body is contained within that can be the, the resultant for the large amount of ashes. So uh, to me, it's not come over as being an issue on my travels, but they, and the few occasions it has been mentioned, they don't see anything wrong in putting any extra into a second urn. Okay. The, the Funeral Furnishing Manufacturing Associations have said, um, if a cremation uses an alternative or eco-coffin, the ash is increased by a factor. Following the research by Intertech, the FFMA has commissioned these factors can now be clearly understood. The effects and amount of ash vary by the height of the person, the weight of the person, and the type of coffin. Um, they've supplied a, an Excel file to, to, to show um, what they were saying there. Would it not be easier, do you think, Mr Swanson, to move to that five-litre um, urn rather than stick to the 3.2 um, so that all of the ashes from a cremation can be kept in, in one container and there can be no debiety about anything? Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, I would agree that anything which is going to uh, be less uh, of a, a disturbing factor to a family, and I can accept that to hand over two ashes, uh, two uh, urns with ashes probably is not good at all. Uh, I do know that the size and weight is sometimes an issue and there is an element of uh, uncomfortableness in speaking to where a large coffin has arrived, an outsized coffin, uh, with the fact that how you physically handle it, the same from the health and safety side, about asking the funeral directors to give them a weight of the coffin uh, because how are we going to handle it at the other side sure. uh, and what we do with it, and that's for cremation. I appreciate the burial is different. Uh, and there is the 
element of embarrassment there of what people try and do is to lessen the impact it's going to have uh, on the bereaved. So in other words, rather than have six or eight people struggling with a big coffin to come in during a service, recommend that the coffin is in place before the people arrive so that they actually don't see that physical side of things. So anything at all which helps to reduce it, I accept that there would be a lot of costs incurred involved in changing from a 3.2 to a 5, but perhaps as long as they had a few fives in store for the few occasions it was required, that would suffice rather than changing it altogether. Thank you. Any of you other gentlemen wish to come in on that point? Mr Powell, please. If I may, yes. I mean, the, the, the guidance around uh, 3.2 litres is a minimum guidance. That's not an absolute, and, and it isn't a case of no other container shall be used. The two main suppliers of what are called polyurns, which are the, the polythene plastic urns that are used for the delivery of, of ashes uh, back to funeral directors or back to families uh, after the cremation process, the two main suppliers are those at the moment. They're, they are supplying, I think, in 4.2 and 4.5 litre uh, containers. Um, the actual number of occurrences, I think, where more than one of those containers is used is very, very rare. Um, it, it really, it, it, in, in a lot of cases where, where remains or ashes are going to be buried or whatever else, the funeral director will actually supply a casket directly to the crematorium rather than the container actually supplied by the crematorium being used. Um, so it really, and, and I mean, interestingly enough, um, to both, both Mr. Morris's organisation and my organisation are working quite closely with the Funeral Furnishing Manufacturers Association at the moment to draw up guidelines, protocols and, and a testing protocol and acceptable results to those mm. protocols uh, to actually move forward with the, with the suitability of coffins for cremation, making sure that they are actually fit for purpose. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Morris? Yeah, I'd like to just echo uh, what Rick has just, just said. There, there are uh, instances, very few, where more than one container uh, might be required. Um, we found that those instances are generally with the eco-type coffins. Uh, uh, for example, there is a, a cardboard coffin that's uh, available that has a high china clay content, which gives it strength and rigidity. Um, that coffin, when cremated, produces two or more standard urns of ashes. With the FFMA research, um, and research into ash residue, uh, from certain types of, well, all types of coffins, then perhaps promotion authorities and funeral directors could be alerted to those coffins that produce uh, more than the normal amount of ash. And perhaps on those occasions, uh, a larger container can be supplied by the funeral director or crematorium. Uh, it doesn't need to be supplied in all cases, just a separate stock of larger urns, um, which would be acceptable to those brief families that choose those types of coffin. Mr. Brown, do you have anything to add? Uh, just to reiterate what, what uh, Rick had said um, about uh, often funeral directors will supply um, an alternative to the, the crematorium supplied urn um, or other receptacle. Uh, and there's a vast array of, of uh, sizes available to us. Um, and I, I don't believe it would be correct to automatically increase the size for every set of ashes being returned to families in the same way as we as funeral directors wouldn't supply a large coffin to everybody uh, for their loved one just because some people would require that. Um, every family, uh, there are a variety of options they have with the, the, the ashes once they're returned to them, so I don't think it would be appropriate to, to supply a large container to, to everybody just because of the very occasional issue with it. Thank you. Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much. Good morning. Can I just return to go back to Mr. Brown, where he said in his submission, the NA, NAFD does not support the reuse of layers, but does support the reclaiming of unused layers. How would you define unused layers? I mean, obviously, but the reclaiming of them. Is there a time limit, or would you? how do you work that out? I just couldn't, couldn't quite follow that. The, Mr. Brown. Uh, we, we support the reuse um, as set out in the bill of uh, unused layers, layers that have been sold to a family but there's never been an internment taking place in that layer. Um, what we're opposed to is the reuse of uh, layers which would involve exhumation, deepening the layer 
and reinterring the, the exhumed remains. D does that happen very often? It, it currently doesn't happen, no. but that's, that's one happen. of the uh, proposals. And how would you define an unused layer? One, one that has not been used for a long period of time? The one that's not been used at all. Um, right. So in, in, in some cases, a family will purchase four or five layers in a cemetery, um, but they may not use all of those layers. If that layer has gone for the, the period of time uh, in the bill, which I believe is 75 years, mm -hmm. um, if, if it's gone for that period of time unused, we would certainly support the, the uh, reuse of, of that by selling that layer to another family to allow them to, to, to utilise that cemetery. And do you think that should, do you think that should be in legislation then? We should legislate on that. That, that's yeah. contained within the, the, that's right. the bill, um, but what we are opposed to is the, the reuse of uh, layers where there have been interments. I see that. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, anyone else want to come in on that point that's just been yes. made? Mr Morris. Mr Morris, please. Yeah, the, the, the reclamation of, of unused layers should be included in the bill, but that doesn't, uh, wouldn't transform cemeteries into sustainable assets. Uh, the legislation should include the reuse of layers that have been abandoned, and abandonment can be proven through uh, proper notification pr processes written into legislation, and those layers reused uh, where remains are, are disturbed, reburied in, in the same layer at a greater depth, uh, and the legislation therefore covers the rights uh, of any families that come forward and object, and if they do, their layer wouldn't be reused, and also protects protects the remains. The remains would be reinterred in the same grave, which would keep the cemetery records and registers intact, and those deceased persons would be traceable in the future. So the Institute is concerned with the sustainability uh, of cemeteries for the future, um, whilst reclaiming unused layers uh, goes some way, uh, it, it doesn't make cemeteries completely sustainable. What would you do with the headstones in these circumstances? I think that, that a conservation management plan should be in place before an authority reuses layers, and this would identify the areas of the cemetery that had historic cultural importance uh, and would, would remove them from any, any reuse restoration process. And it would only be those less significant areas where an impact on heritage, history, and the, uh, the cemetery landscape wouldn't be affected. So That's, that doesn't really answer my question, Mr. Morris. What would happen with the headstones in these circumstances? And any that were, were not of historic importance could be removed. Um, how does that help in terms of the records that you talked about? Because obviously the headstone itself is a record. A photographic record could be kept of, of headstones that are of insignificant importance. Okay, and the industry thinks that that's acceptable. Yeah. For those in, insignificant memorials, yes. Okay. Uh, Jane Baxter, please. The convener. Um, my question alludes to a discussion about two questions ago, and I'm interested in the relationship between funeral directors and crematorium management. Um, you, you, it was mentioned earlier that there might be some liaison about, about the size of coffins. Is that a regular occurrence? Do, 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 do the two sides of the equation work together uh, commonly, or is that only if there's an exception? What, what sort of relationship exists between the two parts of the sector? Who's Perhaps Mr Brown could... Mr Brown, please. Okay. Um, the, 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 there's a constant relationship between funeral directors and, and crematoria. Um, there, there really only is an issue when we're dealing with larger coffins, and in those circumstances we would liaise uh, with the, the local crematorium management, um, and we would perhaps uh, look, as I, I think uh, Robert suggested, we would perhaps look to make arrangements for the, the coffin to be in place in the crematorium before the family arrive for, for dignity reasons. Um, but we would also be speaking to the, the crematory about any manual handling issues and also issues in terms of uh, the, the length of time that the cremation may take and that kind of thing. So it may be appropriate for us to book a, a, an earlier time slot. Uh, we would liaise on a, on a regular basis with crematory about that, that sort of matter. Anyone else want to come in on that one? Mr Powell, please. If I may, yes. Uh, I mean, as, as Andrew just said, there is constant liaison between the funeral directors and, and the management staff at the crematorium. Uh, there would be an expectation normally that the funeral directors would complete a, a preliminary form, which
which would be submitted to the crematorium, which will ask all sorts of questions around that, that are not part of the statutory application. It may be around music at the service, it may be all sorts of different things, and one of those things will normally be around the size of the coffin because there are physical restraints, whether it be because of the size of the opening in the catafalque from the chapel through to the uh, crematorium or the crematory area, and physically the size that a, of, of coffin that a cremator will, will accept. Um, I mean, there are cremators in existence in, in the UK and in Scotland that will take a maximum, uh, I think, 41-inch coffin there are others that will, will uh, because of a different manufacturer, and it may be an older machine, that won't take a, a coffin that's anywhere near that size. So those sorts of liaisons take place constantly on a daily basis, and there'll be telephone conversations between the, the crematorium and the funeral directors to make sure that there is absolutely no misunderstanding about any of those details. Okay, Mr. Swanson, please. You know, you talked there about the size, and yes, that is, is clearly the, the case. And most of the crematoria that are undergoing refurbishment at the moment, they are always going for the, the larger cremator, generally up to 41 inches wide of the coffin. The width of the coffin and that is sort of standardly known. What is not known, though, often is the actual combined weight of the, the body and the coffin, which is going to arrive. Uh, sometimes uh, that is, is given, but not always. And indeed, from the funeral director's side, quite often they don't have the provision to actually weigh it, so they're not able to give that answer. And likewise, at the crematoria, they don't have, at present, a, a weighing facility that would take this. And there's my understanding from the staff there that that also helps them uh, assess how long things are going to take. They know how long you know, a, a normal average body is going to take and what time of day is best place to, to put that through. Uh, so a, a bigger one is clearly going to take longer and there is health and safety implications as well as the handling all the way through. Uh, but of more concern around the country, which has been brought to my attention, is this crematoria not knowing that any items that have been left in the coffin now, usually what happens here is that it's people saying the last farewell uh, to someone, and they're afforded that in privacy. Quite often, it would appear that what's happening is that things are being placed in the coffin, which are innocent, uh, things like photographs. But as I understand it, it's not the photograph, it's in a glass fronted frame and glass appears to be a, a major problem. I don't know the technical side of this other than the, the practical experience and the feedback I get is that the, in effect the, the glass dissolves and the glass can, can uh, affix itself to the brickwork inside which then means it's present for the next cremation and then of course the, it, it, uh, it is liable to stick to further ashes and there is practical issues. The some of it is more worse than that. If a battery, for instance, is left, uh, I'm, I'm aware of like a mobile phone having been placed in a coffin or what appeared to be a mobile phone from and a battery, of course, then exploded, which, of course, can cause uh, damage. Now, the crematoria clearly are, are governed by the emissions through SEPA, which is coming out. The, if they actually breach any of the regulations as to what's coming out of the, the chimney, in effect. Uh, the crematoria say, well, we don't know that, but we're the person that's been penalised for that, not the funeral director. The funeral director is giving an assurance that, to the best of their knowledge, there is no, in effect, forbidden items within that coffin. But that is more of a major issue to me uh, that I'm hearing around the country than the size, and it's something that perhaps by working closer with the funeral directors, uh, that this can be perhaps uh, lessened, shall we say. Jane, please. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thanks, everybody. It seems to me then that being a funeral director is a highly skilled role, requires a lot of sensitivity and communication skills. So. How is the registration and regulation of funeral directors um, managed? Is it compulsory to be registered or um, how is it regulated? Is there training? Do people have to, to, to qualify? How, how does all that work? Is it a requirement to be qualified? Mr Brown first, please. 
the, there currently is no uh, legal requirement. Um, as uh, I, I said in my opening statement, the National Association of Funeral Directors represents, in, in Scotland anyway, um, 369 funeral homes. Um, and in excess of 80% of funerals conducted um, are conducted by NAFD members. We have a code of practice um, and we have a professional standards board. Um, we have a, a number of uh, requirements for membership, which includes training um, it, it, and it includes the, we, we employ uh, four standards and quality managers um, who inspect each of the, uh, the members' premises on a biennial basis. Uh, so they're, they're inspecting the premises for um, the front of house and back of house facilities, mortuary and bamming facilities, um, as well as ensuring that we're adhering with codes of practice in terms of the, the financial aspects for families, invoice and providing estimates and that kind of thing. Um, there are at least one other um, trade association um, which many funeral directors are, are members of. Um, but for those who are not members of trade associations, there are, there are no regulations in place. Are any of those standards enforceable? Are they, are they voluntary standards? Do, do your members, is there any, are there any sanctions if your inspectors <coughs> find that there's been a problem? Um, th there are sanctions um, which could be a, a fine or leading up to expulsion. Um, from the, the National Association of Funeral Directors. I'm, I'm working this through, but they could be expelled and still trade as a, still seek, get employment or be, um, be a funeral director in, a, in another setting. It's, it's, it's only, it's a voluntary, a, a voluntary yes. scheme. Yeah. Yes. Okay. They would just cease to be a member of our association. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Uh, will I coffee, please? Thanks very much, convener. I wonder if I could ask the panel again. To tell me a wee bit more about their views about this 200 yard relaxation. I think Mr. Powell, you gave a few examples of your concerns about that. I mean, the proposal in the bill is to, to remove that uh, restriction. And 200 yards does seem a long distance, but could you give us a couple of examples of whether, where that may actually have taken place and what kind of impact that sort of thing does have? And is, is there any kind of limit that you, you would be happy with relaxing it down from? 200 yards to say 100 or 150, do you have a view on that or is it, does it have to be 200 yards in your view? Mr Powell. Thank you. Um, well, you asked if, if I could give you an example. I think a classic example is unfortunately in Edinburgh um, if, at Morton Hall crematorium where uh, the building of, of housing has been allowed to come right up to the curtilage of the grounds there. And in fact, gardens uh, are somewhere in the region of 25 to 30, 30 yards away from the walkway through the, the, the memorial garden. Um, now, on a Sunday afternoon, as I said, you know, when families are having barbecues, generally doing the things that they do in a, in a garden on a Sunday afternoon, that really doesn't fit with the, the peace and tranquility that, that one would expect when visiting, you know, and, and, and visiting to remember a loved one and sit in peace and. And, and, and think your thoughts. Um, it's, it's a very unfortunate situation. And I think it, it displays, unfortunately, uh, the fact that, that, I mean, forgive me for saying it, but, but local authority planning has not really managed that particularly well. Um, uh, the suggestion in the bill is that, that, the, that the location of, of crematoria and, and what happens around them should be very much in the hands of local authority planners. And I think you know that's an example, and there are there are others within the country where exactly the same has happened. Um, as, I, as I mentioned in, in the sort of opening words, our, our view is that really we would much rather see that 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 area protected uh, for for the life of the crematorium, not not if you like set at the at the, at the building of the crematorium, and then developments allowed to to encroach right up to the, to the boundary, in effect, uh, really to, to, to destroy that, that setting and, and that feeling of, of tranquility and peace and all the other things that the families should be allowed, not only at the time of the funeral, as I say, but when they come back to spend time in the gardens, you know, in remembrance. Well, I, I mean, on the 200 itself, though, is, is, is it a must-be 200 yards in your view, or is it is 100 acceptable, or 150 or something like that? I mean, 
clearly there's pressure on, on development space, space for <coughs> crematory and so on and so forth, and that's what this issue, I think, touches on. Is there any acceptable uh, reduction in that distance, in your view, or does it have to be that kind of distance? I mean, I, I don't think anyone is, is being silly enough to say it's got to be exactly perhaps 200 yards, but I, I, I mean... I, th I think one of the th when you look at the suggestion in the bill and, and combine that with one other point where it, it talks about a crematorium being classified as a building that contains the, the equipment to carry out the cremation, in other words, that's just the crematory, not the, not the buildings that are ancillary to that. In other words, the chapel, the Book of Remembrance room, and all the other things that normally go with a crematorium. It's talking about just the crematory being classed as a crematorium. Now, in theory, that means that a crematory could be, crema could be created anywhere in the middle of, a, a, of a, an industrial estate. You know, and, and, and there are all sorts of things that we are extremely concerned about that may well destroy the current, I, I, I suppose, dignity and, and, and setting that we expect or, or that the public expect to have associated with a crematorium. And a few other gentlemen want to come in there. Mr. Morris, please. Yeah, the, whilst the 1902 Act deals with the construction of a crematorium close to dwellings and roads, uh, the construction of houses and other facilities near to a crematorium is uh, a matter for the local planning authority. Uh, the Institute would suggest that both matters come under the hands of the planning authority, albeit with uh, proper guidance for those that, that, that issue planning consent so that they can fully investigate and understand the need to, to maintain tranquility uh, of the crematorium environment. Wally? Okay. No, I'm happy with that. Can you, could I come and ask yep, a question, sure. please, unless you want to? No, on you go. Um, I was open to ask a question about record uh, keeping. And since you here, take advantage of your, your experience and your, your knowledge. Um, to, my, in my understanding, there is no connection in the national records of Scotland as to where a person is buried. Uh, for example, if you visit a cemetery and you see a person buried there, there is no connection back the way to identify who that person is in the record system. Given that we're looking at improving records management in this whole process, would that be something that you, you would support to, to enable an addition, for example, to the entry in the national records of where a person is actually buried and perhaps where they were also cremated, because that information is, there's no connection between the two, as I understand it. I'd appreciate your views on that. Mr. Morris, please. Yeah, the Institute has campaigned for many years in England and Wales that uh, the registrar of births and deaths, that, that registers the death, is informed of the place of burial or cremation, and that is then entered into the death register. So there would be a, a, a national record. So far, um, the registrar general in England and Wales has, uh, has refused to do so, but it would be a simple, simple matter f for, for that to take place. Anyone else on that point? Mr Powell, please. Um, I, I mean, as, as Mr Morris has just said, the, the situation in England and Wales is sort of nine-tenths of the way there because the, the uh, disposal certificate, the green disposal certificate, actually has a tear-off section which is completed and returned to the Registrar of Births and Deaths, advising them exactly where the disposal is taking place. And yet it isn't actually recorded in the register, which seems like an absolute nonsense. And I'd, I'd agree with you wholeheartedly that that would, if you like, complete, sorry to use the terminology, but complete the circle, you know, so that, that, that record keeping would be complete. As far as cremations are concerned and burials are concerned, obviously there are registers, detailed registers, kept at each of the locations where where those interments or, or where those cremations are, taken, are carried out. But it's a case of identifying where that crematorium or cemetery is to be able to find that register. So, yes, I can see exactly what you mean. Mm. Just on, on my travels, I have been made aware uh, of uh, in one of the West of Scotland cemeteries, an old one, uh, but they've actually been through and checked uh, the cemetery layer registers going back to 1865, uh, which has thrown up difficulties from a, a, a management perspective because what they were found is that some of the, the, the ground there was regarded as common ground and what was termed there as pauper's graves and that on quite a number of occasions there was one placed in a layer 
Uh, those layers were then subsequently sold on. Uh, sometimes it's evident with the knowledge that there would already be somebody in there, not so obvious in other instances, and that at the moment when you speak about reuse and all the rest of it is causing issues to this particular area because they're looking at how they will handle this and how they will know for sure. But to make your point about records, records clearly did exist, and that's it going to be back to those days. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Willie. Uh, George Adam, please. Yes, I'm glad Mr Swanson brought up the reuse of layers. I don't feel so bad bringing the item back up again. It's uh, one of the biggest problems I have in my constituency uh, with regards to cemeteries is that families will maybe buy a layer and be told they can get two, three, in some cases three or four family members within that layer. Uh, uh, within about a 20 or 30 year period, dad dies, there's a 12 year gap or something like that. Mum dies, they get told that there's been a deterioration at the cemetery itself and they can't get the extra uh, people in the layer as well. So we end up going through all kinds of problems with the local authority and we, we can finally get it sorted, but it's a costly venture for everyone to do. So I'm thinking that after 70, if that's after 20 or 30 years, after 75 years, in some uh, cemeteries, if I'm using the one I'm talking about in Paisley as an example, is it not going to be the case that it's going to be very expensive and very difficult for the uh, areas to be able to actually reuse these layers again? Because if it's a problem that's ongoing, I'm getting it regularly, unfortunately, in my constituency business. Gentlemen, anyone want to? Mr Powell, you're looking pensive there. I, uh, well, the only thing I would say is that not every cemetery is the same. Uh, so much depends on the ground conditions that you find in each and every location. Uh, you, you may well be in, in digging in sand in one cemetery. You may have, have sandstone in others. You know, it, th there will be natural restrictions uh, as to the depth that can be obtained in, in, in some layers. Um, and in other areas, it, it may not pose a problem at all. So it's, it's very difficult to be absolutely precise and say that this is what should happen. I know, but family members take it as when they go there, say, 20 years ago, and they said three people in that layer, yeah. then they say, that's it, it's three people, and they've already worked out who's going there. I know, I know. And effectively, when that doesn't happen, then they get very upset and it becomes quite difficult. But I'm just saying, if it's like that, in that scenario, mm. what is it going to be like in 75 years in some of them? Because not all of them, as you've said yourself, are some of the local... In my area, the local authority one's probably the, the, the worst out of the two, or I get the most complaints about. So, you know, how are you going to deal with that in that situation? It's like Mr Morris says, how is that going to actually help you with sustainability of cemeteries? I think the other difficulty, to be honest, is the fact that, you know, we've moved quite significantly with health and safety, you know, and, and the precautions that we have to take when we work in, in, in areas like that and, and actually excavate those graves, where perhaps 20 or 30 years ago you may find that the graves were excavated and not shored, um, that, that, you know, that, that, that different restrictions or, or lack of restrictions were in place. Things have moved on quite significantly. Um, and we really perhaps can't do some of the things today that we could have done 20 or 30 years ago to achieve those results. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing I was going to ask is, um, Mr um, Morris mentioned about the fact of people of historical significance, if you're going to you reuse a grave now. In some towns, uh, like mine, being a post-industrial revolution town, you know, we've got the great and the good in certain parts, but the families have all left. You know, who decides? that it's actually historical significance. We've got a whole bunch of cotton barns uh, whose families are no longer there in the four corners of the world. So who's going to decide whether that's historically significant? There should be a consultation with Historic Scotland mm -hmm. uh, on conservation plans and reuse proposals prior to them taking place. OK, thanks for that. Uh, the, I'm just trying to think... Oh, yes, uh, the other thing I was going to say is how does the bill actually help with uh, the the general upkeep of uh, cemeteries, you know, because it's one of the ongoing complaints that I get, people complaining about the fact that uh, they're not the same as what it was when they go and visit mum or dad every uh, kind of couple of weeks. Uh, how does it help to make them more sustainable and how does it help to actually uh, make sure that it's a better environment for the families who are going to see their loved ones? Mr Brown, do you want to have a crack at that first, please? Um, I think it's possibly more appropriate for... Uh, 
someone who deals with with, with burials to, uh, right, okay. to, to to comment on that. As, as funeral directors, um, we also have have uh, concerns around that, and would welcome anything in the bill that's going to address that. Um, but I, I think it would be more appropriate for, for Mr. Morris, then, please. Yeah, um, I've visited quite a few Scottish cemeteries, and I, I must say that. It, in general, they're maintained to a higher standard than in perhaps other parts of the UK. And I think that the bringing back layers into reuse will help, again, uh, fix maintenance costs through the avoidance of building more sites and adding to maintenance burdens. And by fixing maintenance costs, uh, maintenance can be continued at the same level, which is quite high at, at the present time. Mr Powell? I'd agree with Mr Morris about the, certainly about the condition of the cemeteries. I think that the other thing is, obviously, if you're looking at how effective the bill itself will be, I, I think it's really probably more appropriate to look at the, at the regulations that are developed underneath the bill and how they will actually uh, set out the requirements, if you like, or, or the management of those cemeteries. And, and I'm not trying to, to sort of suggest that you do the same thing, but in England and Wales, we have the local authority cemeteries order uh, which basically sets out, uh, for, certainly for local authority cemeteries, the do's and don'ts and, and, and how they will actually be managed. But, but that's, that comes below the, the actual uh, primary legislation, if you like, in, in regulation itself. And that may well be the way to, you know, to, to enhance this. Thanks. Okay, thanks, George. Um, uh, John Wilson, please. Thank you. Just as a follow-up to... A couple of questions that George Adam raised. Could you advise me, has there been any changes in the regulations regarding interments and the depth of an interment from the surface? Because, like George Adam, I've also faced the problems where people have been told that they could get so many interments in a layer and then when they go to get, you know, deal with the funeral of a family member, are then told, no, you can't get a family member in that layer because there's no space left because the regulations changed. Have there been changes to the regulations? So if any local authority says to a, you know, a family member who has a layer who was told they would get three or four interments in that layer, uh, and they come back and say, sorry, we made a mistake, uh, there's been a change in regulations, uh, we, can't, we can no longer get three or four interments in that layer. Mr Morris, please. There are still instances in Scotland where that third interment can't take place because of insufficient depth. Although there are a few authorities in Scotland that have adopted the spirit of the local authority cemeteries order uh, in, in respect of depths of burial, so that they can guarantee that third burial. So this is a, an opportunity through regulation for the Scottish Government to regulate depths of burials avoid those conflicts where that third interment can't take place uh, and satisfy those bereaved families who have purchased rights for three barrels in a grave and then are told that their right for the third doesn't exist. So those disputes can be eliminated through regulation of depth of burial. Mr. Brown, Mr Brown, is that an issue that your members come across in terms of family members when they're making the arrangements for the funeral to be told that they don't have the yeah. space on that, uh, Un set. Un unfortunately, we do, we do deal with that where it's uh, perhaps uncertain when we make the booking at the cemetery whether there would be space. There would have to be a probe to dis determine whether there's space left in that, that layer. Um, and in some cases, families have to opt for a new layer, an alternative family layer, or in some cases, cremation with the, the interment in the layer because there's sufficient space for, for ashes to be interred but not for, the, for, for a full interment. Um, and and I, I suppose that's... Part of where the NEFD's stance comes from in terms of uh, being opposed to uh, reuse of layers and reuse of headstones is because we already have this experience of families having an expectation um, about that layer, um, which is, is no, no longer able to be fulfilled. Um, and we, as the, the agent uh, booking the cemetery on behalf of the family, often have to, to deal with resolving those, those issues. Just to, as a follow-up to that, convener, just to ask, the interment of ashes, Mr Brown, you made reference to, you know, in, this, in Mr Powell's submission, the, Mr Powell, you've referred to the scattering of ashes on top of a layer, uh, but the interment of ashes in a layer, 
Is there any general guidance uh, through your institute, Mr Morris, to your members regarding how ashes should be dealt with where, a, in Mr Brown's example he gave, where a layer is full but people want to be interred, their ashes interred in that layer? Uh, and how widely acceptable is that within your membership? Mr Morris. The, the Institute's guidance on the burial of ashes in a layer, if there is space for a further coffin burial, is to bury the ashes at full depth so that in the future, should that coffin burial take place, the, the previously buried ashes aren't disturbed. Or alternatively, the, the, the layer owner can agree with the authority that the ashes be buried at a shallower depth, which attracts a, a smaller fee, uh, and that the grave is closed in respect of that future coffin burial. So there's a clear understanding from both parties. The, the Institute would also propose that any regulation in respect of depth of burial, that the depth of, at which each burial takes place is registered so that there's no need for probing. Uh, the authority will always know how much available depth is in the grave and can therefore guarantee it's what is a, in effect a contract with the bereaved family that owns the lair. Right. And that contract would last for 75 years, if not according to the current proposed bill. Yes, uh, that what, would what, be in effect for 75 years, and then at the end of the 75 years, that, that yes. layer would then be open to the authority at that time to make use of that layer. It would also be open for, for the lair owner to renew for a further 75 years. So the same family could, generation after generation, maintain their rights, could carry out further burials, and could actually bring their own lair back into reuse. And this happens across Europe. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for your evidence today, gentlemen. I suspend and we move into private session. <laughs>